Hey everyone, Mr. Walker here. Quick lesson on the carbon cycle. As with all of the other biogeochemical cycles, uh, major things that you do need to know are the reservoirs and major reservoir where we do find the carbon. The cycling pattern that is involved, that's the arrows that we see here, cycling processes, moving the carbon from one reservoir to the other, the different chemical forms that we find in each one of the reservoirs, and of course the human impact on the carbon cycle. I'm going to start this one with the atmosphere, even though that is not the major reservoir for the carbon. In the atmosphere, remember that the major gas is going to be nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, N2, somewhere around 78% of the gases in the atmosphere are nitrogen. Oxygen, second big one, O2, somewhere around 20-21%, but doesn't leave a lot for the remaining gases. And in fact, for the carbon dioxide, somewhere around 0.04% of the gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. Might be a little bit more relevant to talk uh, instead of percentages in terms of parts per million. So the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if we go back about 150 years ago, it was around 280 parts per million. And if we take a look at the parts per million today, it's just jumped over the 400 parts per million mark. And what we'll see is that that is due to human impact, and we'll see exactly what those human impacts are. But starting with that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, let's follow some of the arrows on some of the processes. So how is that carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere? A couple of different things. If we take a look at this arrow at the far right-hand side, it says here carbon dioxide exchange. But what it really is is, well, just carbon dioxide dissolving in the hydrosphere, dissolving in the oceans. So the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, really, the more is going to dissolve in the oceans as well. And the ocean's fairly large a reservoir for a number of different things. It's kind of a heat sink, and it's also a sink for carbon dioxide. So as it goes up in the atmosphere, it goes up in the ocean, and we'll see how that creates a little bit of a concern as well when we do have more carbon dioxide dissolved in the oceans. We see another arrow here that's really going in exactly the opposite direction. So in addition to dissolving in the water from the atmosphere, it can also go from the water back into the atmosphere fairly rapidly with that a relatively short cycle. A bigger concern to us is uh, this one here, photosynthesis. So plants, of course, whether they're terrestrial plants or aquatic plants that we're talking about, or in the oceans here, we can see the phytoplankton, algae that we find in the waterways, they are all photosynthesizers. And what that means is that they use carbon dioxide. So that can be carbon dioxide, of course, coming from the atmosphere, or if you are an aquatic plant, the phytoplankton, or the algae, then you're taking that carbon dioxide out of the water. So that is then going to take it into another reservoir, into the kind of biotic realm, into the producers, into the plants. So again, whether that is the phytoplankton that we see in the oceans, or it shows here a crop that's growing, or the trees that we see, the grasslands, any kind of vegetation that we have, that's going to involve, of course, the process of photosynthesis. Now, plants do photosynthesis um, during the daytime, but during the nighttime, in fact, they reverse that and they do exactly the same thing that we do and animals do, and that is the process of respiration. So respiration is going to be now taking that carbon from biological organisms, whether it is the vegetation, whether it is the animals, or whether it is bacteria, decomposing bacteria, using the process of respiration. And what that is going to do is take that carbon that was stored up in biological organisms in the form of fats, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids, and return it back to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So going back to that uh, decomposition, we can see, well, the process of decaying here, and again, that's going to be the typically microscopic bacterial decomposers, but other decomposers as well, invertebrates and mushrooms that are decomposing. And what they are decomposing are, well, things that have died. So it can be plants and animals that have died, but it's also other organic matter that ends up in the soil. And that can be coming from feces, for example, from, uh, from animals. So as they do decay, those decomposers gobbling up oxygen and through the process of cellular respiration, producing carbon dioxide, 
and that's what ends up going into the atmosphere. Once again, kind of a similar process that's taking place in the oceans here. So we will have the phytoplankton that are consumed by zooplankton, consumed by smaller fish, larger fish, and so on, going up the food chain. And eventually, they're going to die and decompose as well, and that carbon dioxide will then, of course, be returned to the water. Something else going on here as well, a whole bunch of the organisms that we do find in the ocean, they do have calcium carbonate shells or calcium carbonate somewhere in their structure. So these are microscopic structures that we see here, uh, zooplankton, uh, diatoms, they are going to have a calcium carbonate structure, so carbon in that structure. When these do eventually settle down to the bottom, layers of them eventually form, and that's how we do get the formation of sedimentary rock. And if we kind of follow that process a little bit further, uplifting rock formation, the sedimentary rocks, the uplifting of those rocks, and now we have a whole bunch of the calcium that we do find in uh, primarily sedimentary rocks, rocks like limestone, which is in fact calcium carbonate. And we can reverse that process as well through weathering. The weathering of the rocks can take that uh, calcium, uh, the carbonate, calcium carbonate, dissolve it into the water and return some of that carbon back to the water once again. If we do have some dead organisms, typically microscopic organisms like the algae or the phytoplankton, but they can be animals as well and other plants. If they do die and don't, decomposition does not take place, but they're buried fairly quickly and over long periods of time, so if we add in here time, a lot of time, if we add in here high pressure, and if we add in here high temperature, that's kind of the recipe for the making of these guys here, which are, of course, the fossil fuels. So that's kind of a long storage reservoir for the fossil fuels. But of course, what we are doing and what we have been doing uh, more extensively over the last so 150 years ago since the Industrial Revolution is digging it out of the ground, drilling it out of the ground, and then burning it combusting it very, very quickly, and what that does is it takes a long-term storage form of the carbon, and it returns it up into the atmosphere very, very quickly. So in terms of the different chemical forms, what have we come across so far? Well, we've had, of course, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. In living organisms, plants are going to take that carbon and convert it into fats, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. That'll be passed on up the food chain to the animals as well. And then through the process of cytorespiration, plants in the nighttime, animals and bacteria can return that carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. And we also saw in the rocks, we can have carbon in the form of the limestone rocks, the calcium carbonate, and we can also have carbon in the form of the fossil fuels, the oil, the gas, the natural gas like methane, which is CH4. So those are some different chemical forms. In terms of the major reservoir, it is going to be in the lithosphere. Most of the carbon is locked up in the rocks, in the sedimentary rocks, in the lithosphere, and it's through the process of weathering that it's going to make its way into the water and eventually up into the atmosphere as well. So some other processes here that we see, in addition to combustion reaction and the burning of fossil fuels, we can also have something, well, as simple as forest fires. So these can, of course, be naturally occurring forest fires caused by lightning, for example, or they can be human-caused forest fires as well, returning that carbon dioxide very quickly back up into the atmosphere. So important processes that we do have, very important processes, in the carbon cycle, uh, the dissolving. Dissolving in the oceans, that's gonna be a big one. Photosynthesis, mentioned that one already, that's a big one. Cellular respiration, that's gonna be a big one. And combustion reactions, that's a big one as well in terms of some of the cycling processes. Now in terms of the human impact, uh, once again, we are most definitely changing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And since the industrial revolution, this is what we have seen is a huge increase in the concentration of the carbon dioxide. 
0.04% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere may not sound like a lot, but keep in mind that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. There are some other greenhouse gases. There are some more potent greenhouse gases that we talk about. Other greenhouse gases include things like water. Water is a greenhouse gas. Methane that I mentioned, that's a greenhouse gas as well. Nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons that also destroy the ozone, they are a greenhouse gas. But the big one that we hear about most of the time is the carbon dioxide because that is the one that we are changing the most through our activities. So our activities, really what we're talking about is this one here. It is the burning of the fossil fuels. So digging them up out of the ground, they were formed millions, tens, and even hundreds of millions of years ago. And it took a long, long time to form those fossil fuels. And we're digging them up fairly quickly, burning them fairly quickly. And even though the overall percentage doesn't look like it's changing that much, when you do take a look at the parts per million, we can see that it has increased dramatically over the last 150 years or so. So consequences associated with that, of course, are going to be climate change. So usually we hear about that in terms of global warming, because once again, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's going to hold on to the heat energy, prevent it from escaping into outer space, and globally warm up our planet. But other things related to climate change as well, extreme weather that we hear about, also associated with the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Another one that I do want to touch on, I mentioned that as you increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that also increases the carbon dioxide in the oceans. This is kind of significant because this carbon dioxide, it does react with water in the atmosphere, but also in the oceans. And when it does react with the water, what it is going to form is an acid, carbonic acid. This carbonic acid is not enough to really acidify the rain and lead to acid rain. It's sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere that lead to acid rain and acid deposition. But it is definitely a concern in the ocean because even a little bit of an increase in the acidity, a little bit of a drop in the pH, and what it has a major impact on is the formation of the calcium carbonate shells that we find. So very, very difficult on coral reefs and on organisms that rely upon the formation of the calcium carbonate shells because this carbonic acid is an acid and it will either prevent the formation or it will dissolve away the calcium carbonate shells that we do find in these organisms. And that is referred to as acidification of the ocean. So those are the major points associated with the carbon cycle.